All right, folks, I think we should get started, and we ha may have a few more people trickle in and join us. Um, but I'm so glad to see those of you who made it today during weeks five, six of the quarter. I know things are getting very busy for you, and uh, I hope everything is, is going okay. You're taking care of our, yourselves and also checking in on <clears throat> friends and colleagues of yours um, when the opportunities arise. So welcome to week five of our seminar. Um, I'm happy to be with you, and I have just a few reminders and a few slides as usual to start us off before we get into the reason that we're all here, which is to hear from our guest speaker today. Um, so we are halfway through the quarter. Somehow, you know, those first couple weeks turn into we're halfway there, so it goes very quickly from here on in, I know. So I just want to give you a reminder that if you have only submitted, you know, one or two, or if you haven't submitted yet, um, then please make sure to submit your weekly summaries if you're in Nutrition 400. Um, and also be starting to look ahead to the final assignment, which is more of a reflection on the seminar as a whole. Um, and then for Nutrition 500 students, uh, just a reminder that you will have uh, an overall summary and a reflection due at the end of the quarter. And so your notes and your attendance and your participation are warmly, warmly welcome and encouraged throughout. Um, and just a reminder that there is a kind of bigger assignment for you all that's coming up at the end of the quarter. Uh, I have a message to pass on to you from Dr. Malone, who was our speaker from last week, who did such an incredible job at giving us an overview of opportunities, but also real challenges that urban food systems face in terms of uh, actual production. And um, I know that a number of you have reached out to Dr. Malone, and so she uh, asked me to share some resources with you and to let you know that more information will be forthcoming as, for example, her internships get posted. Um, if you participate in a community garden or farm, then please consider taking the survey that she mentioned um, and that has been rolling out since the summer and that will continue roll out, to roll out this year. And so there's a link here and it's also posted in last week's module on your Canvas site. Um, and just as a kind of high level reminder of what the survey is about, it captures how people interact or it's meant to capture how people interact with soils and food that they grow at their garden or at their urban farm to get her a better idea of how people may come into contact with contaminants in their gardens. Um, it'll take about 30 minutes to complete and the first 200 people to take the survey will receive a gift card by email. So encouragement to check it out if you are a community gardener or urban farmer and uh, your input will be very appreciated and, and utilized. Welcome to November. How did that happen? That's the other thing that's going on. So November is the start to a month-long celebration, acknowledgement and, and celebration of Native American Heritage Month. And so this, I just took a snapshot from um, the White House briefing page uh, with President Biden's declaration um, and pro proclamation, rather, on the Native American Heritage Month that is happening for the duration of November. And uh, I encourage you to check it out. I put the link on the slide as well. And it is worth reading through, both to give some context as to why, we, why the United States has a month to celebrate and honor and appreciate uh, both heritage, um, but also, as President Biden frames it on this site, to continue to work toward the support and uplifting of Native American communities. And with food systems, there is so much incredible work that's happening in this space. Um, by, led by indigenous communities throughout the United States and around the world, in fact. And I wanted to draw your attention, it's not on this slide, but to draw your attention to um, the film Gather. Has anybody seen that? Yes, okay, so a couple hands going up. It's a really wonderful documentary exploring the intersection of uh, indigenous food systems across the country. And so there are, I think, four communities that are um, highlighted with incredible initiatives that are really inspiring, that really go beyond food security to look at food sovereignty issues. So looking at real community ownership of these issues that we're talking about in class. Um, not to name names, but I think it's on Netflix now, so should be pretty easy to check out if you are so inclined and if you haven't yet. 
So, happy November. Uh, our usual familiar diagram is up here before you, reminding you what you told me on the first day of class um, in terms of what about urban food systems interest you, and the circles um, that we're going to focus on are, you know, have expanded a little bit, and really we're focusing on, I think today, you know, a lot about community resources, access, equity, sustainability, nutritional security, and we'll get into that and more with our guest speaker. And so without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker and to share with you the format for today. So we're going to run a little bit of a different seminar than we've been having. Um, and I'm going to get to interview our guest speaker in front of you today. So we're going to sit up here at the front and have a discussion about what Bella Sanchez is working on through, uh, through their involvement in Solid Ground and specifically at Mara Farm. And um, Bella has an amazing history, including time here at the University of Washington. But my first question is going to be asking Bella to introduce themselves. And so I'm going to leave it there and just invite you on up, Bella, to come join. And I'll be there in just a moment. And I'm going to put up a different backdrop for our conversation. And, and our Mara is going to help us with that to facilitate this conversation about Mara Farm. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right. Hi. Thank you for being here. Sure. I'm delighted to have the chance to have this conversation with you. So we're going to have to share this microphone. Just going to let you know. Ah. <sighs> okay. Whew. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. So as I teed you up before, I'm going to ask you, Bella, if you could please introduce yourself and share with the class how you, specifically, you know, the work that you do now, but also briefly if you could speak about the pathway that you took to get there. Yeah. I'm going to pass it over. Thank you. Great. Yeah, I was just sitting there, or now I'm sitting here and thinking about how weird it is to be sitting here because I used to sit there for, you know, three years. Actually, I never took a class in Kane 120, so that's not <laughs> totally true, but you get what I'm saying. Um, my name is Bella, my pronouns are they, them. Um, and it's funny, I haven't even been like a functional adult for very long and it still feels hard to like carve out the path that I took to get to where I am now. I'm gonna take this off to talk because it's just a little bit challenging. Um, so, uh, like I said, I was an undergrad here. I started here in 2017 and graduated in 2020. Um, I got my bachelor's in environmental studies, so I was in program on the environment, and um, I sort of got taken under the wing of Eli Wheat pretty early in my uh, undergrad career. If you don't know Eli, I'm sorry. You should go seek him out and meet him, because um, he's just like the best person ever, and I'm just like, like, if I start talking about him, I'll get too effusive about how grateful and how much I love him. But he really, like, burst open this whole world around sustainable agriculture for me. Um, I grew up in Texas uh, in the big, big city, so had never really thought about farming um, as, like, a thing that I might be interested in. And then suddenly I was like, oh, actually, this is something that's really cool and that I care about a lot. And... Um, I ended up doing my capstone internship at Eli's farm out on Whidbey, so Skyroot Farm, and my research uh, initially was focused sort of natural science, soil science-y, thinking about sustainable livestock production and how um, rotational grazing has like positive impacts on the soils of um, pasture land. Um, and then this really funny thing called COVID happened and um, every soil lab in the country closed uh, when COVID started. And so I had like 60 samples in the trunk of my car that could not be processed anywhere. Uh, and so then I did what researchers everywhere should be able to do and I hard pivoted. Um, and so instead, I interviewed 
um, farmers that I knew who used rotational grazing to ask them about their experience with rotational grazing and actually ended up um, being able to investigate this really interesting thing, which is that farmers who rotationally graze sort of extol the virtues of rotationally grazing, but the science hasn't totally borne out that it's better than other management styles, um, which has a lot to do with the fact that everywhere is different, and so it's hard to compare apples to oranges to pineapples. Um, but that was what I did, and then when I finished, I was like, I hate agriculture, and I'm done, and I'm leaving, and I'm going to do grad school, um, and I went to grad school at University of Oregon, still in environmental studies, um, but I had sort of, I'm being dramatic, I didn't hate agriculture, but working with livestock was really hard and had sort of made me like, I never want to do this, this is not for me. Um, and so then in grad school, I really shifted my focus toward food and culture and sort of um, food as this connective tissue of humanity. Um, not in terms of growing, but in terms of how we eat it and um, who makes it and what are we making when we make food. Um, and I wrote my master's thesis on um, national identity production in the Netflix television show Taco Chronicles, because that's a really cool thing about grad school is that you can do research on a television show and it's legitimate. Um, and I was thinking through like how is Mexican identity being represented through the way that food is talked about in the show? Um, and what does that say about how we communicate ideas about who we are and who is included in identity and who's excluded and sort of those kinds of things. Um, and I finished that degree actually in September, um, but I in the meantime also started my current job, which I ended up in by accident. Um, I had been planning to take six months off after grad school because grad school really burned me out. I was exhausted. I felt like my brain like couldn't function normally anymore. Like I was just like, I am the shell of a human being. Um, and I, I need to just, I was gonna go live at Eli's farm and just like sleep a lot and help on the farm and hope to be better, but um, this job came into my inbox uh, via the Good Food Jobs job board, which if you're interested in jobs and food, that's the job board to get on. It is just, yeah, it's the job board to be on and um, a position for the bilingual youth food educator at Solid Ground had opened up. And I was like, well, that's weird because that's sort of all of my skills. <laughs> um, and I really love working with kids. I really love working with food. Um, it just like sort of meshed all these different things together. And I was like, I'm gonna apply, but nothing's gonna come of it because like I'm not done with school for six months or I think it was six months at that point, maybe like four and a half months at that point. And I was like, there's no way. And then something about working in nonprofits is that it takes a hundred years to get hired by a nonprofit and so Actually, they ended up hiring me right when I was done with classes and the timeline worked out perfectly. Um, and so, yeah, so then I ended up at Solid Ground and it was, yeah, a complete accident. I hadn't meant to go back to working and then it turns out it's like the best job for me ever, um, at least right now. Um, and my title has changed a little bit. I'm now the youth education coordinator, so I moved up a step uh, sort of quickly because of some reasons you don't really need to know. But um, yeah, so my current role, I do coordination around youth education. So um, we do youth education with preschools um, through the Farm to Table partnership with City of Seattle and Tilth Alliance, um, among some other organizations. And I also do elementary in classroom education. So. We have three partner elementary schools, Lowell Elementary, uh, Rising Star Elementary, which is in Beacon Hill, Lowell is in Cap Hill, and uh, Concord International School, which is a bilingual elementary school in South Park. Um, and I also do education at Mara Farm, which is also in South Park. Concord Elementary is like five minutes away. And we do a lot of field trips at Mara. Um, so yeah, that was a really long-winded answer, but 
that was my path. <laughs> That was wonderful. Thank you so much. And I just want to say it's such a gift to hear pathways for people who get into food systems work. I hear from students a lot who are either in the food systems major or in other programs saying, I'm really interested in moving into this field, but where do I start? How do I get in there? And actually with food systems, there are so many different pathways in. And so Bella, I, I think that was a really valuable uh, journey to, to go alongside with you. And I just want to note for everyone's you know, just so your heart rate can come down, Eli Wheat is coming to present next week. I don't even know if you know that. So you will all get a chance to meet him, and he is wonderful, um, and he'll, we'll be talking about the, the campus farm next week. And so there's wonderful connective tissue, as you mentioned, food systems as connective tissue, or food as connective tissue, um, that also happens around food, where, you know, there are incredible networks of people that are developed as well. Um, and we require people from pretty much every background in order to make food systems really successful and really inclusive. So thank you so much for that. Um, I, I always say, if you work in food systems in Seattle, you know every other person who works in food systems in Seattle. Like, I can't tell you the number of times like a random person will be like, oh, I also worked with that person at this organization four years ago, and now they're your coworker. And like, oh, everybody is applying for the same job. It's like a very interesting, yeah, like way that all of these pieces sort of are overlaid because um, it's a very community oriented field. So people really know each other. Yeah, exactly. Very well said. So today you're here specifically to talk with us about more uh, community farming, community agriculture, and to focus in on Mara Farm, which you mentioned um, as part of the, the work and the focus that you do right now. Um, but before we kind of delve into Mara specifically, and you can walk us through the map in just a little bit behind us, um, just to also say that, of course, the frame for this seminar is urban food systems. And so the topic today is really focusing on not just urban food production, but all the questions around it kind of what are the models that are being used? Who's actually producing the food? Who makes decisions around the foods that are being produced? Who's accessing those foods and how? You know, what are the pathways? What's the systems approach? Um, so before we kind of delve into the details, I just want to ask if you could speak about your conception of urban food systems um, and how you see yourself and your organization contributing. And so I guess that would be solid ground contributing through MARA. Yeah. Yeah, that is a really big question that I don't know that I'm going to have the best answer to because I, I don't know. I feel like A, maybe my answer changes all the time and B, it's a really big one that I'm thinking about a lot. But I think like the thing that's really cool about urban food systems is how much innovation happens in them um, because of all of the constraints that are involved. Um, which can be like really stressful, but also can be really exciting if you let them be exciting. Um, and so I think when I think about urban food systems, it's hard for me to pin down a definition other than that it's like happening in an urban area because my hope is that I don't know all of the ways that people are growing food in the city um, and that it's like always changing and evolving. Um, but in terms of how solid ground is contributing to urban food systems, um, so solid ground is an anti-poverty organization um, started way back in like the 80s, I think, as a different organization. I think they were called like the Fremont Neighborhood Housing Association or something. Um, so as the name suggests, they sort of started uh, with housing work for unhoused populations, which we still do a ton of. Um, Solid Ground does um, emergency housing work, um, benefits legal assistance, so helping people with uh, different forms of benefits um, and providing legal uh, help with that. Um, we have a, like, we have several housing locations, so, um, the one you might be familiar with is if you know the housing that's inside of Magnuson Park that used to be army barracks, that is run by solid ground now, um, and that's all um, low-income housing. 
and there's long-term low-income housing and there's short-term low-income housing. We have housing for people who have uh, been victims of domestic assault. Um, we do, I think like something that's really special about Solid Ground is just the breadth of things that are happening. Um, another thing to know about Solid, I promise I'm gonna get back to food, but I think all of this is like important to think about how nonprofits operate in the space. Um, so Solid Ground is an organization with 275 employees, which sounds like a lot because it is, but over 50% of those employees are bus drivers um, because the largest department at Solid Ground is transportation. Um, and if you ever see a, a city of Seattle, a King County Metro bus that says access on it, all of the access buses are driven by Solid Ground employees. Um, that program was created by Solid Ground um, and those buses, if you don't know, are buses that run on irregular routes to give people who don't have access to other forms of transportation um, bus access. So all of that is to say that Solid Ground has its hands in a lot of pies in a way that I think can be really positive because there's all this cross-pollination of people with really different sets of expertise interacting with each other. Um, and on the food side, um, the food teams are actually, our department is relatively small. Our department is hunger and food resources and that department is split into two. So one half of hunger and food resources is food system support um, and food system support primarily works with the food banks in the city. So I think that's not my team, but I think there are 27 food banks in city of Seattle. Um, and Solid Ground plays a major role in coordinating those food banks, in helping them get resources, those kinds of things. And then my team is the other half of the team, Community Food Education, and we do what the name sounds like, and also Mara Farm is under um, that branch. And so I think thinking about those sort of two different components of the food system that Solid Ground is involved in, um, well, really it's three because there's involvement on the food bank side, which is a distribution branch of the food system. Um, and then uh, the food education piece, which is a lot about community outreach and also obviously educating people um, about food in various ways. And then Mara Farm is sort of running the whole gamut because it's got production happening. We do mostly education there. Um, and we do some distribution ourselves through Mara Farm. Um, yeah, I don't have a strong conclusion to that, but that's, <laughs> but that's how I think about how solid ground is sort of contributing to the, food, the urban food system. Excellent, thank you so much. And now I'm just gonna prompt you to please just, you know, swing open the, the door for all of us on Mara Farm, right? So, this is really the, the centerpiece of why you're here today to share with us details of this one urban farm. And there are multiple farms uh, running in the city of Seattle and they all use different models. Mara Farm contains multiple models. Um, and uh, just, you know, just to give you a few questions, but I'll ask for you to fill in whatever details you'd like, but you know, wondering about the models of urban production that are being practiced and the different organizations, if you want to speak to some of that, of, uh, you know, who's involved in that site, um, but also, you know, kind of what's being grown there. Where, where is Mara Farm? You know, tell us a little bit about, about the, the site and the history and what foods are being grown there. And as I alluded to before, you know, how, who, who kind of owns that space, um, both um, legally, but also in terms of the decision making about how the site's managed, which foods are grown, um, and then we can either in this question or in the next one talk about, you know, how that food is distributed. Mm -hmm. And so just, yes, teach us about Mara Farm, please. Yeah, Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, so this is gonna be a hefty answer because Mara Farm is a pretty complicated place uh, in the best way possible. Um, and before I start talking about all the different sites, I actually want to start by acknowledging a person who is not here um, who is the engine of Mara Farm. That's Scott Bamer. He is the farm coordinator at Mara. Another word for that might be farm manager on a production farm, um, but nonprofits have like their own sort of ways that they break out what types of uh, jobs you have. So he's called the farm coordinator. He is the 
lifeblood of Mara Farm. He is an incredible farmer. He's been at Solid Ground for 12 years. Um, and yeah, I just think it's really important to say that like I am here to talk about Mara Farm, but I am not like the brains or the heart of Mara Farm. I'm just like somebody who loves Mara Farm and who works at Solid Ground, but I really think like giving Scott his flowers is not something he gets often and also he's not here so he doesn't know I'm giving him his flowers but he really really deserves them he is an incredible person um and just like really at the heart of what Mara is um uh, or at least what the solid ground portion of Mara is um so I want to start with that just because yeah he is everything I'm saying is just like nothing in comparison I mean right he can't be here because like he's doing the harvest I came from the harvest but you know I tapped out after two hours he'll be there all day so you know those kinds of things um so this is a map of Mara farm that one of my lovely colleagues uh water colored um we don't have a digital map of Mara farm and yesterday when I asked her to send me this she was like we should really make a digital map and I was like yeah so you know, we're always striving for better. Um, you can ignore the numbers. This map was made for a scavenger hunt, so the numbers are completely irrelevant to you, but that's why they're there. Um, but uh, I'll sort of talk you through the different components of Mara Farm. Um, so Mara Farm is uh, a farm located on Mara Desimony Park. Oh no. Um, <laughs> Located on Mara Desimony Park. Mara Desimony Park is in South Park, as it says up there. Um, it's right past Marginal Way, um, very close to the Duwamish. I mean, if you've been to South Park, you know where South Park is, but it's sort of like this little pocket um, neighborhood uh, in West Seattle-ish. Uh, it's like right at the south end of West Seattle, and it's really close to Burien and White Center. It's a really cool neighborhood. Um, it's also the neighborhood with the highest percentage Latinx community in the city. Um, so that's something really important to be thinking about when you think about who the community that Mara Farm serves is, um, because South Park is the most Latinx neighborhood by like a mile. Like the next highest is not even close to South Park. So um, Mara Farm is located there. You might be thinking, what does Mara Desimony mean? Um, the Maras and the Desimonies were two Italian immigrant families um, who lived in South Park. Uh, Frank Mara uh, still lives across the street from Mara Farm. He likes to come over and do random projects for us, and he's a lovely old man. And yeah, so there's like this really cool long history. He's still really connected to his family's land. Um, and the Maras were the people who actually farmed the land. So um, Mara Farm has been in continuous agricultural production since settlers arrived in Seattle. And obviously there is a history of indigenous food production in this area as well, but um, I will not pretend to be an expert on that because that would be foolish. So um, I know uh, that it's been in continuous agricultural production and South Park, um, because of its location, has always been um, a neighborhood sort of populated by immigrants or lower income communities. Um, and so those immigrant populations have changed over time, but Italian immigrants at the time were very low income um, and uh, marginalized. And so they lived in South Park and the Maras farmed basically all of the land that is now farmed by multiple organizations and the Desimonies sold them the land um, and the Desimonies also had a hand in creating Pike Place Market. Um, so there's some, yeah, there's a lot of really cool like interconnections of the Seattle, the, you know, the modern Seattle food system to the Maras and the Desimonies. Um, the Maras sold the land to City of Seattle um, in like the 70s or 80s, I believe, um, and City of Seattle in a an truly unexpected move actually left the farmland there instead of turning it into a park. Half of the park is a park now, um, but the other half has stayed agricultural. 
Um, and so the land itself, um, this is where it starts to get a little bureaucratic. The land itself is owned by Seattle Parks and Rec. The park is managed by Seattle Parks and Rec, but the farms are not managed by Seattle Parks and Rec. So Parks and Rec does not get to make decisions about what happens on the farms themselves, um, but the park that is not on this map, but is like to the, if you, if you continued right on that map, it would be the actual park. Um, and there's also some like trees that are outside of the fenced farm area, and those are also managed by Seattle Parks and Rec. Um, then within the farm, um, so I've been saying I work at Mara Farm, but I technically work at the Solid Ground Giving Garden, um, which is in that upper left uh, area. And this map is oriented correctly, so Solid Ground is in the northwest corner of Mara Farm, um, where you see the two, uh, that, that diamond is our rain cover, the brown square is our shed, and the green rectangle is our wash pack. Um, so the wash pack is where you wash and pack produce. Um, and we have about uh, three quarters of an acre in production. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's solid ground. I'm not gonna go too far into that. And then next door to us, uh, if you travel south, um, all of the area, both that big rectangle that says Salsa de la Vida, and then also the like triangle and the circle, all of that is managed by Salsa de la Vida. Um, Salsa de la Vida is a community organization um, that was started by four women from Guatemala um, who were frightened, disappointed, unsettled by the statistic that Latinx people in Seattle have the lowest access to fresh produce. Um, and so they started Salsa to uh, combat that or to start helping their community. Um, so they are an incredible organization um, and uh, still run by the same four women. Um, they uh, also have a partnership with another community organization called Via Comunitaria, um, which uh, does similar work, not food systems based, but also works with the Latinx community. Um, then north of Salsa, between Solid Ground and Salsa, you have Waiwi. Waiwi is Young Women Empowered. Um, they are a community organization um, that does what the name sounds like. They do work with young women um, and they run internship programs at uh, their plot. Um, then to the east of Solid Ground, you have the Mien and Mung Community Garden. Um, so the Mien and the Mung are two uh, minority groups from Southeast Asia um, who have come to the United States as refugees uh, since the 90s. Um, there's a huge Mien and Hmong population in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and there is also a sizable uh, Hmong and Mien refugee population in Seattle. Um, and a lot of those people now are second or third generation, um, but the community garden is managed by a commu uh, sort of a coalition, a co-op of uh, community members who farm together uh, in that area. And then south of the Mien group, um, you have a big pea patch section. Um, so if you don't know what the pea patch program is, it's the community garden program in Seattle. Um, and the way pea patch is designed is that the plots are only large enough, uh, or they're only designed to feed your own family and it's, you're not allowed to sell produce off of them. Um, and so the pea patches at Mara actually are part of the farm pilot program, um, which is something city of Seattle is piloting in a few areas to have pea patches with larger plots um, so that people who are interested in selling produce can um, use them for that purpose. Um, and then the last thing you'll see on the map is the chicken coop, which isn't actually in the picture, but it does exist. So the chicken coop is managed by a cooperative of neighbors of the farm. So people who live in the nearby area who wanted chickens but didn't want them on their own property. Um, the chickens uh, were illegal 
uh, when they were put there because you are not allowed to keep livestock on city of Seattle land. Um, but if you live in a community that the city neglects, then it might take them a few years to notice that you're raising livestock on their land, and by the time they notice, they'll grandfather them in. Um, so the chickens are still there. They are legal now, uh, but they weren't when they were put there. Um, and the way they work is that all of the neighbors who are part of the cooperative uh, take care of the chickens a week at a time. Um, and they rotate through, and if it's your week to take care of the chickens, it's also your week to get the eggs. Um, so that's how they cooperatively manage. Um, so the last thing I'll sort of touch on is Solid Ground donates all of our produce. We don't sell anything. Why we donates their produce and also mostly shares it with their interns. Salsa is selling their produce. Um, so they sell their produce through a CSA, and they also do some, um, excuse me, selling at the Mercadito in South Park. South Park doesn't have a full-size farmer's market, but some community members run a small market through the summer. Um, the Mien community gardeners also sell their produce. They sell it um, through a wholesaler that is a, vol it's a volunteer-run wholesaler that they created to sell their produce wholesale. Um, because without getting too bogged down in how wholesale works, it's a hard thing to break into. Um, so that's how they do theirs. And then Pea Patch is a bunch of different people, so they're all doing different things with their produce. So that's sort of a rundown of like the very different management styles that are all happening at Mara Farm and how those uh, people are using their produce. And there is a coalition, a Mara Farm coalition, uh, that meets once a month to talk about what's happening at the farm, different decisions that different organizations are making, um, dealing with parks and recreation. Um, parks and rec is not part of the coalition because they aren't part of the farm and also because, I'm gonna tell you, no, I can't because we're being recorded, but the thing about bureaucracy is it's very contentious sometimes. Um, and so you're having to navigate different relationships with different um, departments, and that can be really challenging. Um, but Department of Neighborhoods, which is the department that Pea Patch is part of, um, they are part of the coalition. Their Pea Patch manager comes to the meetings. Um, Salsa is part of it. Why we, um, the Myanmar farmers are part of the coalition, but they don't come to the meetings. Um, which makes sense because they're just community members and a lot of them are pretty elderly. Um, so I think they mostly just sort of do their own thing. Um, and then Solid Ground is part of the coalition. Um, so yeah, that's how, that's how Mara Farm works or like everybody works together to keep Mara Farm soldiering forward. Thank you. That was a lot of a lot of different models, a lot of different cultural communities, a lot of different um, decision making models, and also food marketing pathways that you just described there. And so, in terms of urban food systems, we're always thinking about you know the kind of upstream and the downstream effects, right? Kind of what's going into the system, both in terms of products and crops and inputs, but also in terms of decision making, right? And and, and how you just described co-ops versus nonprofits versus businesses um, versus you know a pea patch program. Those are all really important models to keep in mind for urban food systems. That there isn't a one size fits all, um, and that there's room for a lot of different models. And then on the other end, you know, thinking about those those marketing pathways, I think is also really useful both in terms of sales and the nonprofit or the donation pathways. Um, so thank you. I. Uh, I wanna move us into uh, a, a question that I think is probably gonna be the one to take us through to the end of the seminar, um, but it's around you know, both the kind of uh, focus and need, to, and need to focus on justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and kind of how, what Solid Ground's approach is, or, or if you can speak broadly to Mara Farm's approach to that, but also how it intersects with Nonprofits, and I just want to call attention to one of the readings um, that you provided for us today, Bella, on nonprofits, and specifically on the term was nonprofit industrial complex, right? And so thinking about these different models for engagement and for decision making, 
And also thinking about, you know, their strengths and their, some of the real limitations that, that uh, you know, are being illuminated through texts like the one that you sent us. So I'm gonna pass it over to you. Yeah, it's a really big conversation that I'll try to tackle in 10 minutes. Joking, never gonna tackle it in 10 minutes. But um, yeah, it's really layered. So one thing I didn't touch on is where we send our produce. So our produce gets donated primarily through two avenues. So um, our produce goes to Providence Regina Food Bank, which is the food bank in South Park. Um, and it also goes to a partnership with the CMAR Health Clinics, um, which are uh, FQHCs, federally qualified health centers in um, South Park. There are a few locations, but we work with um, the South Park location and the White Center location. Um, and we have a partnership with them called Farmacia. Um, haha, farm, Farmacia, I hope you understand the pun. Um, and yeah, so our produce also goes there. Um, so all of our produce is ideally reaching people who have a harder time uh, accessing fresh produce, um, which is obviously becoming more and more of a problem with inflation and um, just rising prices. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know how much you guys' like, brains explode every time you go to the grocery store, but mine certainly does anytime I'm buying food. So um, we're you know, trying to stem that a little bit. Um, in terms of uh, justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, all of those things, um, at an organizational level, Solid Ground um, is thinking about those things a lot. Um, I think we're doing really good work in thinking about those things and talking about them as much as we can be. Um, at the farm, I think we also are. I think it can be challenging at the farm because um, the thing about and now we're gonna start going into sort of the complexities of nonprofits. But um, the thing about running a farm, the way that we do is that we need a lot of volunteer labor um, and the volunteers are rarely people from the community, um, which makes perfect sense because those people have a lot going on. Um, but what it can mean is that the people can and does mean is that the people producing the food are not members of the community feeding their own community. They're outsiders to the community um, coming in and feeding the community and then leaving again. Um, and that is like even, um, even more uh, exaggerated or more noticeable in that we get a lot of uh, corporate volunteer groups, which a lot of nonprofits do corporate volunteer um, partnerships. So. That means you know a group of 15 Amazon employees who are doing a day of giving um, will come to the farm uh, and they'll be the ones to work for the day. Or um, who else do we get? PCC corporate, um, Microsoft comes a lot. Uh, Blue Origin, which is the Amazon space project. Um, there's all these like groups of people who um, make a lot more money than I do. <laughs> Um, who get to sort of come and donate their time and then leave again. Um, and we do try really hard to, you know, emphasize, we're really glad you came, you did good work, you did not solve poverty today. Um, and, you know, people know that, or at least I hope they know that. Um, but it can, for me, it can be really hard um, to sort of deal with that dissonance around, um, believing in food sovereignty, believing in building community to grow food, and also feeling like, well, if someone has to do the shitty work of pulling weeds for five hours, I would rather it be somebody who like makes more money than God than somebody who's like sacrificing a work day to come do that for us. So there's like a lot of complexity around corporate work groups, and we're always trying to navigate how we make that more um, equitable and more spacious, trying to think through how do we talk to corporate work groups about the ways that they're interacting with the space or um, how do we, you know, talk to them about, hey, like you, it costs us this much money to run the farm for a day. Can you like make a, an equivalent donation to sort of like fund the farm for the day that you come? Like all of those are things we're always thinking through. Um, but I think that's really different from organizations like Salsa or like the Mien farmers who are 
growing food for their own community. They are selling it, but they're doing it internally and actually building community resilience in doing so. Um, and that is a tension, right? Like there's a tension between um, asking community members to step up and be the ones to establish food sovereignty and having nonprofits who have access to more resources or, um, you know, I'm salaried. Like, I get paid regardless of how much food is grown on the farm, and that is good. And Scott gets paid regardless of how much food is grown on the farm. And that's good because it means that we can focus on other things because ultimately the goal of the farm for us is education. It's not... Um, maximizing production. Um, but the people who run salsa have to think a lot more about their bottom line. And so that shakes out really differently. Um, and so those are sort of like some things around justice or equity that I think like not necessarily trouble me, but that I'm always trying to think through in terms of the work that we do. Um, and how we are making the farm an equitable space. Um, and then sort of blowing up from that or pulling out from that, thinking about nonprofits um, and the nonprofit industrial complex. I hope at least one person read that reading because it is a spectacular book um, and really will like force you to think about a lot of things that you maybe don't want to be thinking about, but also like you do want to be thinking about. I don't know. It's really great. And I think the name nonprofit industrial complex is like an incredibly apt one um, because nonprofits make a lot of money. Um, I don't make a lot of money, I should be clear. <laughs> but nonprofits as organizations all kinds of nonprofits, especially large nonprofits like Solid Ground, have a lot of money passing through them. Um, and they're doing great work with that money. I'm not saying we shouldn't get the money. I would love if Solid Ground would get more money. But like, um, the scale of money that's coming through Solid Ground is like enormous compared to the scale of money that's coming through Salsa. Um, and that's really important because um, there's sort of a lot of layers to it. Like, yes, we have access to more resources, but there's more overhead in a nonprofit. So, um, you know, the money is going to more people, um, but we are salaried. I get paid through, or Scott is a better example because my work is not primarily the farm, but Scott gets paid through winter. Scott makes the same amount every single week. He doesn't have to worry about whether he sold enough at market. He doesn't have to worry if he has to take a day off from farming because he's sick. Like all of those are things that he can sort of be comfortable knowing that everything will be okay um, because he works for an organization that's going to pay him no matter what. Um, and that's good. I would, yeah, I, <laughs> I want people to be getting paid no matter what. Um, but uh, I also want salsa employees to be getting paid no matter what. Um, and so I think like something to be thinking about because we're reaching the end and I just sort of want to uh, conclude or think through this is like Mara Farm is incredible. Every organization working at Mara Farm is incredible. I am so grateful to be in that space with so many different farmers. And I think the work that Solid Ground is doing is really important work. Um, and another organization that you could be thinking about who isn't here, but they actually are at a way larger scale than we are is TILF. TILF is a huge organization that runs a community farm. TILF gets so much money. I mean, I hope nobody at TILF would deny that, but they get a lot of money. Um, but they're not solving hunger um, and neither are we. Um, and I think we're doing really important work and I think we're helping people who are hungry, but ultimately donating food is not going to solve um, the poverty crisis because it doesn't actually give people a pathway to access forever. It just gives people a stop gap to get, on, get to the next week. Um, and another thing to think, through, think about, especially as you like head into other things, is like food banks were supposed to be a temporary solution and now we've had food banks for like 50 years. Um, and that's a huge problem. Um, that's something that was supposed to last not very long is now one of the primary ways that we're giving people access to food. Um, and Mara Farm is a part of that system. Um, 
And I'm glad that we are, and I also think like the ultimate goal for us as an organization should always be to put ourselves out of business. Um, we should always be striving to make it so that we are obsolete and other ways of uh, acquiring food at the community level are the ways that people are able to access food. Um, so I hope you don't take away from that that nonprofit farming isn't great, because it is, um, but it's really complicated, and it should be. It should be really complicated, and yeah, that, that should be your ultimate takeaway, is that like everything is really complicated, and if it seems easy, you're not thinking about it enough. <laughs> And with that, thank you so much, Fella. Let's give a big warm call. Thank you. Thank you for that. We don't have time for questions. I'm sorry about that. But the students are going to be submitting their questions. And we will share a subset with you so you can see what they're thinking about. Hope you all have a really good week. And um, can't wait to see you next week, where we'll be talking about UW Farm, our own campus farm.